Well, let's put all that off and begin. Uh, our first reader is, I've always envied this guy. He is what, he published his first book when he was 19 years old. There's one other dude that I know of that did that. It's Peter Beagle. Delaney. Delaney. Delaney did. Delaney did. Paul right. And uh, James Joyce. <laughs> <laughs> and other four of us. <laughs> All right, okay. All right, but anyway, it's quite unusual. Quite unusual. Uh, he, uh, I wouldn't say rocketed to fame with Ariel, but made a huge impact on the science fiction field, and the book has been followed up with a couple of uh, one sequel and other books, and um, helped to define this field that we call urban fantasy, which is what we're talking about tonight. This. Uh, so, um, rather than go on and on about this, which we will do later, let me introduce Stephen Boyan. Thank you guys for coming out on a Saturday night. And um, uh, The story I'm going to read from you is, um, the story in the urban fantasy anthology is uh, from my novel, Avalon Burning, which is... Um, uh, which continues uh, Ariel and Elegy Beach as the third of my change books. These are a sort of post-apocalyptic fantasy that assumes technology doesn't work and what we'll call magic uh, does. Avalon Burning is about a 14-year-old girl named Avi who uh, is a former shapeshifter. Uh, that ability's been taken from her. And she is um, uh, on this sort of blind vendetta against the centaurs in these books. My centaurs are not like Greek centaurs. They're skeletal and... Uh, tall and very violent and scary and smart. Um, Avi uh, in the book is, um, she's come to Los Angeles uh, looking for her um, uh, evidence about her parents. She can't remember her parents, but she started having dreams about them. And uh, on the road to Los Angeles, she's kind of made a road buddy, buddy out of road bunny. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's another book there, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> the next and the exciting boy. Um, <laughs> Uh, a road buddy with a, uh, a centaur out on his wander here. She calls Che. And um, uh, the section I'm going to read from you is a different section of the novel that is in the Urban Fantasy Anthology. Um, Avi has just figured out uh, where she needs to be to find out more about her parents when she has this enormous fight with her friend on the road, and they kind of break up. And so we pick her up as she is um, uh, on the Hollywood freeway heading toward Universal Studios. Uh, and... Um, she saw it on the hilltop a mile ahead. Uh, Universal City in crazed letters on the sloping roof of a collapsed parking structure. Two spindly toy-like towers rose like smokestacks above the jumbled shapes beyond. One of them a metal staircase in a tall clear tube. Despite being so close to the place she had spent years finding, it, it was okay with her to just decide to stop here for the night. She would give her all tomorrow to explore, and her eagerness was now, uh, I can't remember, her eagerness was now trep uh, tempered by a trepidation. Whatever lay ahead for her at City Walk was not buried there, but within herself, and all that is hidden is not treasure. She circled the bus warily, but saw no bones, scat, fur, stains. She pulled the brittle rubber door flap and the door scraped open. She held her bowie ready and banged a fist against the metal. Nothing. She went inside and checked beneath the seats. The usual dust and cobwebs, trash, uh, old pack rat nests. They didn't do. She spread her bedroll in the aisle near the rear door and set her bowie on a nearby seat with a handle, handle pointing toward her. Then she took off her shirt and checked her bandages. They were dirty, and a dark, thin crust of blood had stained along some edges. She wet the bandages and peeled them off. The wounds felt hot, and they were getting itchy. The skin around them mottled green and purple. Clear pus ran. They would scar, but she had plenty of those. She rinsed the uh, wounds with bottled water and then turned the bandages over and reapplied them with duct tape. She, then she put her shirt back on and went up front and sat in the aisle before the enormous uh, windshield. Shadows yearned across the valley now, the sun's gold in a crucible of mountain saddle, cooling, draining, gone. The 
The night descended, and her back went straight, and her breath caught, and she knew she had to go outside. She faced the east and watched the moon come up, and she remembered. We would stand naked, three of us, holding hands, and wait. My mother urging me for days before to eat. You have to eat. It takes a lot out of you just to change, and you won't have anything left for after if you don't eat. The moon would come up full, and I would feel their hands changing, my hands changing. And then we would run, loping and happy and smelling all the world upon the storied air, everything gone low and monochrome. We ran together, bodies touching and teeth snapping, and we hunted, the events a jumble. The time unmarked, the night lasting all my life. Every month it lasted all my life, and I never wanted it to end. And when I woke up naked with the day, I woke to mystery. Cuts and broken fingernails, an aching stomach, the taste of copper. And I would cry. And mom and dad would stagger to me, not quite yet themselves, and try to reassure me with mouths still lacking speech. And I never told them that what had frightened me was not the waking, but the return. I had visited some storybook land and then been forced to leave. The gibbous moon diminished as it rose above the bus. I used to talk to you. You were a good listener. She lay in her sleeping bag between the seats and tried to ignore the deep itching beneath her bandages. Even through the bandages, the wounds felt hot. Her forehead felt hot. Are you out there, Che? I'll bet you are. God damn, you played me. She brought her arms into the sleeping bag and drew it tight across her shoulder. She was sweating. you we're not mad at you okay but you need to be quiet just get inside here and don't move till we come get you okay can you do that for me in the end there was nothing to it really she woke up feeling she had hardly slept and she rolled her bedroll and tied it to her backpack and put that on and then left the bus behind the exit ramp for Universal City Walk right outside the door as if the bus had stopped to let her off here. There was a story that she loved for her father to tell, the story of the wolf and the three little pigs. She remembered it as she headed towards City Walk. There were three little pigs, and they were just learning how to get by in a world, and each of them had his own ideas about how to do that. So when it came time to get a house, they had their own notions about how to do that, too. Now, the first little pig was kind of cheap and lazy, so he built his house out of straw. And his second pig was not quite as cheap or lazy, so he built his house out of wood. But that third pig, he was all about the long-range planning. <laughs> What's that? Why, thinking ahead. So this third pig knew that if he used good stuff, he'd be safe. So he built his house out of bricks. So the three little pigs lived in their three different houses, and they were pretty satisfied with themselves. And everything was fine and dandy, until one day a wolf showed up, and he decided he wanted him some pork. Was he a wolf like us? You win the big stuffed bear girly girl, he was just like us. <laughs> so one night when the moon is full, the straw house pig a knock on the door. Little pig, little pig, let me come in. How come he can talk when he's a wolf? He was just changing. <laughs> so anyway, the straw pig says, not by your hair or my chin, chin, chin. Then I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house down. He can't do that. No, he can't. He was just lying. <laughs> what he really did was just tear out a big hunk of straw and go into that house easy as you please. 
So now, there's one less hungry wolf and one less cheap, lazy pig for the world to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! <laughs> you said it, kid. So, one night a month later, the, the uh, Woodhouse pig gets a knock on the door. Little pig, little pig, let me come in. Not by the hair on my chinny chin chin. That's right. Besides, you ate my brother last month, asshole. How stupid do you think I am? <laughs> then I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house down? Hell no. Then I'll set this son of a bitch on fire and eat me some roast pork. That's just what he did. <laughs> Yay! Another one for our side. So, a month later, little pig, little pig, let me come in? Nope. A month later, it's broad daylight. Hello? Anybody home? Screw you, Wolf! You ate my brothers. And I got a big-ass machete here with your name on it. You come into my house. Well, I'm very sorry for your loss, sir, but I'm not a wolf. I'm a man, as you can see. And I'm here to help homeowners such as yourself defend themselves from vicious wolves that have been reported in the area. <laughs> well, I can see that you're a man, but there's no way a wolf could get into my brick house. Yes, sir, and a very fine house it is, too. But I install barbed wire fences to protect homeowners such as yourselves from damage in the event of wolf attacks. Would you let me show you how I can help you? There's no cost or obligation. Well, you are a man, so if I tell you to go away, I'll still be safe in my brick house. So, the pig opens the door, and the man comes in, and he pulls out a big knife, and he stabs the pig right away. <laughs> and the pig says, but but you're not a wolf. And the man says, oh, Mr. Pig, don't you know that you don't have to be a wolf to hunt things down? And the man ate a lot of pork, and when the moon came up, he had lots of energy to change and go running in the hills, and now he had a nice brick house to come back to in the morning when the sun came up. The end. <laughs> She stood before an intersection. Traffic lights and street signs barely discernible amid the overgrowth. She turned right. When she saw the bright orange building beyond the drop-off zone, she realized she had lived here longer than any other place she had been her whole uprooted life. And that she was back at last. That she was home. The familiar buildings and crazy angles and vibrant colors. City Walk was really just an outdoor hilltop mall. It ran straight and uh, looped at the east end. Its unique geometry and uh, visibility made it appealing to scavengers and squatters. So she decided to walk around to the west entrance. She passed the pancake parking structure that had been a favorite playground, ivy-threaded restaurant facades, uh, uh, dead palm trees, Sherds of bright, enormous flower pots, berms of windswept dirt and trash, all as she remembered. The west entrance was a large concrete plaza with portable iron rails to, uh, uh, to herd people toward the studio tour. A dry fountain with a large metal globe, Universal Studios in faded gold across the equator. Behind it rose the matte black monolith of the Black Tower whose dark stairwell she had climbed with her father. She realized now that he'd been keeping a lookout for scavengers and squatters heading toward their hilltop sanctuary. They never felt safe here. It had so many hiding places, and it was in good shape, and we could go running in the hills when we changed, but they couldn't defend it. They were always afraid of losing it, of being found. She turned her back on the entrance, her head pounding, and her palms sweating, and her skin cold. Jay, I know you can hear me, so listen up. You leave me the fuck alone in here. This is mine. No answer, no motion. She hadn't expected any. All right. She turned back and stepped across the disjointed tiles toward the broken shops of City Walk. Even in decay, the place was a riot of colors and angles and shapes competing for attention. Some untenanted carnival left to ruin and reclamation. 
a wonderland to a nine-year-old. She stood in the bright day amid these final relics of her childhood, and she could only see the staircase tower. Past the prop spaceship half embedded in a broken storefront, it rose high above the hilltop mall. It was enclosed by metal mesh panels, but from the ground it looked like a staircase in a clear tube. No, you can't climb up there, her father had told her. The, the whole valley could see you up there. You'd look like a fly on the side of a drinking glass. She looked down the dirty walkway, past overturned kiosks and skeletons of dining table umbrellas, the waiting path ahead. But the tower. She remembered the dull gong of her footsteps on its metal stairs, the thrilling vertigo, the bird strikes on the metal mesh, the entire stairwell baking in the sun, the view from the top, the entire valley spread below her. I climbed you. They told me not to, but I climbed you. And Dad saw me up there, and he yelled out, Jesus, F and Avi, what the fuck? Get down from there! And I came down as fast as I could, but I was afraid to come out to the mall because I knew I was in big trouble. And Mom came running up saying, what is it? What's wrong? She climbed up there is what's fucking wrong. Climbed up, waved a big white sheet for all we know. Avi, why did you do that? What did we tell you? She put a hand on Avi's shoulder and looked at Jim. Maybe no one saw her. Yeah, well, now I still got to go up on top of the Black Tower and look around. Can I come, Daddy? Yeah, I think you've done enough looking around for one day. What do you think, Abe? He was afraid. They both were afraid. And that was when she started to cry. Her mother held her and her father bent to her. Look, I'm not mad at you, sweetie, okay? I just need to go up there and be sure everything's all right. He straightened and looked at Maria. I'm going to come back as fast as I can. If you hear anything, if you see anything, get her out of here. Don't wait for me, all right? Okay? Prometame, Maria. All right. He ruffled Avi's hair, and they watched him jog out the west entrance. Her mother looked worried, but she smiled at Avi. It's going to be a little while, though, Bolita. Maybe we should... Her face went hard, and Avi turned to see her father running toward them, waving, go, go, go. Her mother grabbed her arm, and Avi saw her weighing options, the calculus of cornered creatures. They ran. They were quickly in the central courtyard underneath the metal framework dome. Their shoe prints mapped their way because the roosting crows had made the courtyard nearly white with shit. Now the crows flew off at their approach. Her father ran a hundred yards behind and gaining. Behind him came a manifold pounding, and Avi knew then what had found them here, what she had caused to find them here. Go! He yelled, go! They ran as no full human could through the fountain court, and yes, there's the giant blue ape clinging by one fist to the side of a building, and beyond him, the narrow pathway loop, all as she remembered, as if waiting for her all this time, Avi five years and how much death later, with her wounds and scars and fury, back here to recover what could not be reclaimed. An arrow shot past her mother and clattered on the walkway ahead, four feet long and thick as her finger. Now, Avi looked back. Now she saw the centaurs, emaciate and tall, and arms held back and leaning forward as they galloped, dark and plated and pitiless. Her father within striking distance of their spears and arrows, but they had not struck. Why had they not struck? There's more in the loop, she yelled. And as she said it, another group of centaurs galloped out from between the shops in the loop ahead. Her mother grabbed her arm and said, come on! They cut across the walkway toward the cineplex with its row of glass doors. If they could get through the lobby and into one of the rear theaters, they could run out the uh, emergency door and into the uh, access road. Her mother led her up the wide orange staircase beside the rusting escalator. At the top of the stairs, she looked back and saw Jim shut the thick glass door and shoot the top and bottom bolts. All the other doors were locked. They would not hold, but they would by time. Jim ran up the escalator as spears and arrows hit the glass behind him. 
At the top of the stairs, he met Maria, both of them panting, both of them staring at each other. Avi was crying, and Maria grabbed her arm and led her across the mezzanine, while her father dragged two trash cans to the escalator and pushed them over. Shh, it's okay. Come with me right now, okay? Just come on. Daddy has to come, too. Daddy's busy, honey. Come on. He'll come up with us later, okay? She opened a door and put a hand on Avi's shoulder. Look, I promise you, we're not angry at you, okay? Just get in there right now, and don't move until we come back for you, okay? The room was tiny, with two small windows in the far wall, and taken up by some machine, and crowded with big metal discs. Barely room for a little girl to sit, and nowhere else for her to go. It's like a hiding place, just for you, okay? No, 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 I, I want to go with you. Avalon, listen, I have to go help your father. The door will lock behind you. Just get in there and don't move till we come back for you. No, no, I gotta help you. You know, Bolita, you gotta be my big girl right now and get in there and don't make any noise no matter what you hear. Can you do that for me? Don't, don't leave me, Mama. Even from here, they heard the break and fall of shattered glass. I have to go, honey. We love you. It wasn't your fault, okay? It's nobody's fault. A quick kiss, and then she was gone, and Avi stood there in the dark. Outside, in bright light, 14-year-old Avi looked across the shit speck walkway at the shattered doors, at trash cans heaped about the entrance, and heard the pounding up the stairs, the guttural shouts, her father yelling, her younger self still sat there trembling in the dark and heard the chase and fight and pounding steps come outside her door, thinking, I, come back, please come back. Thinking, I gotta go help them. Thinking, but I promised. Thinking, but it's my fault. And then the sudden shock of light from the two small windows. She sidled along the wall until she saw that they looked down upon a large room with rows of seats and a tall and a huge gray curtain. On the lower left, a door had opened to the outside, and this was the light she saw by. They got out. They got away. But the door stayed open, and the huge gaunt shape that filled the doorway now was unmistakable. In that harsh light, she saw her father and her mother run down the center aisle and stop. Her father holding a machete, her mother empty-handed, the centaurs pouring down the side aisles now and then slowing as they understood there was no hurry now. Her mother said something to her father, and he shook his head. She tried to take the machete from him, and he held it out of reach. The centaur standing in the aisle as if awaiting some announcement. A door banged open, and the curtain left, and a centaur calmly walked toward them down the aisle, huge and empty-handed, the black trench of his shadow in the aisle, his long hands open wide. Little pig, little pig, let me come in. Her father turned to face it with the machete raised, his free hand pushing Maria behind him. The machete swung and was caught up at the handle. Her father was lifted off the floor, his machete taken and the trapped wrist squeezed. In that large space, all could hear the crack, the silent moment following. Then he was lowered and released, his free hand coming up to ward the blow, the arc of motion already delivered, his head grabbed by the hair, his body falling backward to jet blood upon his, her mother, the head still in the clutching hand, dripping darkly from the neck and held up now before the dark plain head that caught to one side. The eyelids fluttering, the mouth still open for the scream that never came. Below the head, the flat, wide, lipless mouth stretched open. Some scant vision left as he was stuffed down that remorseless gullet. Her mother, standing with her father's blood still warm upon her, the stump neck body at her feet, her mother not moving, not fighting, but not surrendered, waiting for the unavailing moment. The centaur offered her the machete handle first, uh, uh, 
handle first, the blade still stained with her murdered husband's blood. Her mother hesitated and then took it, all the centaurs watching. Her mother did not look around and did not look at Avi and did not look at the exsanguinating body at her feet. She looked at his killer and only there. And she raised the long flat blade up to her throat and put a hand against the keel and turned her head and cut across in one quick motion. Then the machete lowered and her mother fell and the door closed and she stood there in the dark and listened to them leave. She stayed there for two days, parched and hungry and sitting in her own filth, until finally she knew that if she stayed here, she would die. She found the remains of their bonfire in the open space near the bowling alley. The charred bones of two centaurs lay across the fire's wrinkled bones. Arranged upon a shop display case near the pile of char, two broken arrows and the stained machete. She drank and ate and stared at nothing until exhaustion made her sleep. On the third day, she wheeled the uh, furniture cart behind her down the access road behind the multiplex. She opened the emergency door and propped it, wheeled the cart in, a filter mask across her mouth and nose, like some final human in some final wreckage. But the bodies weren't there. And so she left, left that room, left the mall, left that life, just walked away, down into the feckless world, released to the beckoning wild and to her long and blind vendetta. You have to stop crying. You have to be quiet. Don't open the door till we come back. Little pig, little pig, let me come in. I promise you, we aren't mad at you. It isn't your fault, but it was. It always was. I'm just a little kid. I didn't know. I didn't mean it. It isn't fair. Please. All that rage. That righteous vengeance. And it was always only me. Shh, no, it's okay. It's not. It is not okay. Not by the hair on my chinny chin chin. Mr. Pig, don't you know that you don't have to be a wolf to hunt things down? He found her delirious and burning with fever. He found her on, uh, sobbing on her hands and knees in the middle of the walkway. He found her because he could not let himself abandon her. He approached her empty-handed and she tried to kill him. He held her wrists in one hand and took away her bowie and set it out of reach. And then he lifted her, struggling in his arms. She beat him and he carried her. She cursed him, and he carried her. She begged him just to let her die, and he took her from that gaudy mausoleum and cantered down the hill, down the wide and curving avenue to the base of the tall black tower with still taxi cabs and tour buses, the dead marquee down into that still dead world. Mr. Pig, she said, Mr. Pig, put me down. Please, Mr. Pig, just let me die. I want my mom and dad. Mr. Pig, my house is made of glass. Thank you. Something to cheer everybody up on. <laughs>